Hello, everyone, and welcome back to 305 Insights, where today we're discussing what can be dubbed by many people as the Dublin disaster. FSU goes overseas in Ireland to face off against the Georgia Tech Yellow Jackets and come back home with an 0-1 record as they fall 24-21. Not only an 0-1 record, but 0-1 in the conference as well. But we'll see how that plays out later in the season. So we'll try and find some good to take out of this game. However, there's going to be a lot of, I don't want to say negativity, but in reviewing this game, we're going to have to get serious about a multitude of things. And to me, I want to start off with the most concerning part about this game was the play of the defensive line. As you heard in the previous podcast, we have hyped up this defensive line to no end. Pundits around the country, as well as insiders surrounding the program, have said this is going to be the best defensive line under Mike Norvell. Pete Thamel even did a video preview before the game on College Game Day on ESPN about how they expect this team and this defensive line to be the most talented one in the nation. And we got one tackle from Patrick Payton, one tackle from Joshua Farmer, two tackles from Darrell Jackson, and two tackles from Marvin Jones Jr. Those are your big four. This is a team that they were going up against that ran the ball 36 times. They only passed... 16 times. And as a team, we had three tackles for losses. One by Shaheem Brown, our safety. One by DJ Lundy, a linebacker. Half of one by Blake Nicholson, another linebacker. And one of the backups on the defensive line, Daniel Lyons. One had uh, it was Joshua Farmer had the one hurry that this defense came up with no sacks one pass deflection by Kevin Knowles it it was just a team that got pushed around and for all the information that was put out there about how this is going to be the deepest, most physical team in terms of the trenches that Mike Norvell has had at Forest State. And they were blown off the line this off the line of scrimmage on both sides of the ball. We're going to be extra harsh on the defensive line. However, the offensive line will not escape criticism as well. A lot of this falls on the individuals themselves, the players, obviously, because they're the ones out on the field. The one who's also going to get criticism for me is Adam Fuller, the defensive coordinator. Now, I think I've made my stance on Fuller known throughout the years of this podcast. I don't think... He is a top-tier defensive coordinator in college football. I do think he has benefited from the outstanding talent that has come through this program on a variety of levels. I mean, just in this game alone, you see how important linebacker play is. And the fact that we don't have a Kalen Deloche or a Tatum Bethune to clean things up, reared its ugly head today. The fact that you didn't have a guy like Fabian Lovett, who was strong against the run, or 
Brady and Fisk up the middle as well, eating things up. You have to put your players in a position to succeed. And the fact that this was a team that only threw the ball 16 times throughout the game, and you consistently played a nickel defense, it's just you can't just sit there and constantly constantly play 4-2-5 and just have a bunch of cornerbacks and safeties and whatnot on the field when this team that you're facing is averaging 5.3 yards a carry. Jamal Haynes, their main running back, averaged 6.8. Haynes King had 54 rushing yards. He only averaged 3.6, but he did his job. Chad Alexander had 7 for 41. Eric Singleton had 1 for 10. Malik Rutherford, 1 for 9. And Zach Byron, 1 for 1. Backup QB, who just did a QB dive for to get the touchdown. Where are the adjustments? Where are the adjustments, Adam Fuller? You cannot just lean on the fact that, oh, we have a very talented defensive line. They'll get the job done. If you don't see them getting the job done, there needs to be help. Put these players in a position to succeed. And also, remove players who are put on the field and they look like a gaping hole on the defense. And one of those people I'm talking about is Omar Graham, the linebacker. Notice how I haven't said he recorded a tackle. Out of the three linebackers, DJ Lundy had seven tackles. Cam Riley had seven. Blake Nicholson had two. Justin Cryer had one. You have not heard Omar Graham's name because he didn't record a tackle. And he was on the field a lot. And you know what? He was targeted a lot. In the sense that Georgia Tech, when they realized he was on the field, they would mix things up. They would change the play call. And the confusion on the defensive side led to certain things happening. I believe they ran that screenplay to Malik Rutherford. And Omar Graham was the one who missed his assignment. If this team is going up against someone who goes well against the run, obviously you're going to play DJ Lundy. He did not have the greatest game. But, again... Adam Fuller needs to take more. I don't want to say responsibility because obviously he's the defensive coordinator and he knows what he needs to do to get the job done. However, between the lack of adjustment in the play calling because his bread and butter last year and the year prior as well was this was a second half team. This is a team that shut down the offenses of the opposing, opposing teams in the second half. Now, granted, he only allowed three touchdowns. But you scored with about a little over six minutes left in the fourth quarter. And you never got the ball back. Georgia Tech messed up the snap on a third and seven, or a second and seven, and made it third and 18, I believe. Almost pushing them out of field goal range. Virtually, like, making it a tough one. All you had to do is hold them to a sensible, like, seven-yard gain or something along those lines of just, you know, just making it a stop. Obviously, if you got a sack, that'd be even better. But you let them gain, I believe it was 12 yards because it was fourth and 
they, they let him gain a huge chunk play. And the fact of the matter is, uh, let me see if I can look it up real quick. Yeah, so it was third and 17, and they let him complete a simple screen pass to Singleton for 12 yards. That allowed for a more realistic 44-yard field goal attempt. Let's say you only let them gain seven yards and make it fourth and ten. That's a 50-yard field goal. Puts It allows you to put some pressure on this kid who missed a field goal earlier. 44 yards isn't easy, but it's also, again, a 50-yarder, 50-yarder plus. That's, that's more difficult to make for a kid who's never taken a field goal in the fourth quarter to tie or take the lead in a game. This defense did create two fumbles. One of them was on that third and 17 play. There was another one that they created as well. And they did not capitalize on that opportunity. Just an overall disappointing is the kindest word I can use right now for how this defense, specifically the defensive line played. What was viewed as a major strength coming in this season will need to show a lot against Boston College. As silly as that sounds, but remember, this is a team that gave them fits last year because they have a dual threat quarterback who is more prone to running than Haynes King was. In the sense that I believe he had a thousand rushing yards last year. And again, this is this is one of those teams that could be slightly improved because you have Bill O'Brien as your head coach. But again, you had Thomas Castellanos, who threw for a little under twenty three hundred yards but also had 957 rushing yards and 11 TDs. We will see, again, you have a severe or significant, you could put severe too, talent advantage against Boston College. How will they handle this loss? Mike Norvell has been a great head coach in terms of what we call the response towards adversity. Let's see what happens in this coming week where they play Labor Day. You've got that extra few days to prepare and see how it plays out. Now let's switch over to the offensive side. Alex Alex Atkins was not coaching today at offensive coordinator due to the mishaps that occurred off the field with recruiting. And I don't know what happened today. In the sense of, I know there was, you know, the the field condition in terms of it was a little wet and whatnot. That's no excuse. I mean, you play in Florida. You're going to run into those situations. It's not like you haven't practiced that. How conservative this game was called was nothing short of astonishing. You came out big on the first drive with a touchdown and you had, I believe it was 40 yards. No, you had 58 yards in the first drive of rushing. And then you finished for the rest of the day with 40 additional rushing yards. That's pretty crazy. Considering again, we thought one of the strengths of this team would be the veteran leadership of that offensive line. Darius Washington, Richie Leonard, Marie Smith, Keandre Jones, Jeremiah Byers. 
well over 150 starts between the two. Oh, I'm sorry, between all of those guys. They could not establish the run after the first drive. And again, the lack of adjustments was frustrating. It was mind-boggling. Georgia Tech and their coaching staff picked up on the fact that they were calling a conservative game plan. They were stacking eight in the box, and they still thought, hey, let's run the ball. Wasn't the smartest idea. Hundred and ninety three passing yards on the day, ninety eight rushing yards total. Just it's a lot of concerning stats that it was just wasn't enough big plays. There's a few times like when DJ missed Ja'Kai Douglas deep, threw it a little bit short. That that would have obviously made a difference in how the defense could have respected the running game. Because that's what you – going into the season, that's what we talked about. You needed DJ to play in a sense of to not turn the ball over, but also hit the deep shots to keep the defense honest. That's why this team was built this way on offense. We talked about it. You don't have the Johnny Wilson. You don't have the Keon Coleman's. You want speed on this team. That's why you have Malik Benson as your number one. That's why you had Jalen Brown coming in as the transfer from LSU. And you didn't see a lot of it. They didn't create that separation which was the concern going into the season. Shakai Douglas had four catches for 55 yards. Malik Benson, four for 39. Then you had two running backs in Roy Dell Williams and Lawrence Tofili with both three receptions. Then finally you get to Ketron Portier, one for 15. Kyle Morlock, one of 12. Jalen Brown, two of 11. Jalen Lucas, a running back, 105. So you had Malik Benson, who you expected to be in the top of the reception list. You had Ja'Kai Douglas. After that, you have four catches from your other wide receivers and tight ends. That's not going to cut it. Especially when your rushing game is 31 carries for 98 yards with a long of 28. That 28 was a touchdown run by Lawrence Toafili. 3.2 yards a carry. Lawrence Toafili, again, had that 28-yard rushing touchdown. He finished with eight carries for 32 yards. On paper, that sounds good. You have four yards a carry and a touchdown. 28 of those came on one play. So the other seven carries... He managed to muster four yards. Roydell Williams, the transfer from Alabama, had 12 for 38 with a touchdown. Jane Lucas, 2 of 13. Kazeo Holmes, 2 for 8. DJ had 6 of 7. And Cam Davis had one carry. So there goes a game for Cam Davis. You only have a few more left to play him. You don't want to burn the red shirt. But snuck in one carry for him. DJ overall finished 19 of 27 for 193 yards. There was some insane stat where I believe in the first half they averaged point negative point one yards throwing the ball in the sense that it was dumping a lot in the backfield. They were not passing the line of scrimmage in terms of the ball flight. The pass itself was not passing the line of scrimmage. Ah, it's just it's just insane how conservative this game was. And it's 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 not 
something that you can fully point to and be like, oh, this is DJ's fault. Oh, this is this. It's just too many missed blocks. Too many missed tackles. I believe the total that PFF gave out was 11. That might change. That might that might be a conservative number is 11 missed tackles. So I just it's just mind boggling. Georgia Tech is a solid team. But the way they looked, it made it look like they were the ones that came into the game with the narrative that FSU had in the sense of what we're talking about in the trenches. It's just not what you would expect from this team, from this coaching staff. I mean, you're going to have to run the table just to earn a shot at the ACC championship and a berth in the college football playoffs. Georgia Tech was a 7-6 and six team last year, and they have an over-under of four and a half total wins coming into the game. Now, Vegas could have underestimated Georgia Tech. However, I do believe they have one of the tougher schedules in the country. And there goes your... You know, going into the season, you thought, okay, FSU would have trouble with Miami, Clemson, and Notre Dame. Those would be your three toughest games. He had a sneaker pick or sleeper pick when it came to facing SMU. Would they have enough depth by the time they played FSU? But it's just... How do you let DJ go? I believe it was six of eight in the last drive of the game that they had for 82 yards. And then for the rest of the game, you just basically let him do nothing. For the rest of the game, he basically was, what, you take six of eight away. So you're looking at 13 of 19 for basically 112 yards, give or take, 100 so yards. 110 yards, 111. How how does he look so poised and converting two fourth down conversions? And you don't let him do that throughout the game. Where's the trust in him? I know there was a lot of times where he missed certain plays by like a second. But you can't just bail out, bail out on him after that. It's just, again, this coaching staff is building the right culture here. However, there's always concerning things that happen throughout games where you just let the talent win out. Rather than actually executing and defining the plays properly. FSU averaged 9.6 yards per carry on its opening drive. And somehow finished with 3.2 yards per carry as an average for the game. Again, 58 yards in that first drive rushing. 40 yards after that. Where is the adjustments? So. Well, we'll see how the season develops. I do have confidence in Mark Dorvell and certain members of the staff to right the ship. But if not, we're going to have more serious discussions about the pitfalls of this staff. I think I made it clear how I feel about Adam Fuller. You've seen the weaknesses 
with the linebacking core. Might need to have start having that serious discussion, not just for, you know, bleeps and giggles about Randy Shannon, but between his recruiting lack of prowess and the fact that you have Ernie Sims, an FSU legend at linebacker being an analyst. The replacement's right there. There's a lot of things that need to change on this coaching staff in the sense of you have a lot of guys carrying water above their weight and other guys who need to step up. Because it seems like this team bought in on their own hype and didn't go out there and execute. So not only am I looking forward to how the coaching staff responds, but how the players respond as well. Where's the veteran leadership going to come from? You had, you know, the linebackers last year in Bethune and Deloche. You had Jared Verse, Braden Fisk, Fabian Lovett. You had those guys on defense. On offense, you clearly had Jordan Travis and Keon Coleman. More importantly, Travis as the catalyst and the guy who's been in the system for the longest. Who's going to step up this year? Is it going to be Shaheem Brown? Is it going to be DJ Lundy on defense? Is it going to be Patrick Payton? It's got to be one of these internal guys that have been in there for the while, been in the system for a while. There are certain guys that need to step up on each level of the field. I have no doubt that Shaheem Brown is being very vocal throughout this whole week of what they expect. He's one of the leaders on this team. Can DJ step up and lead that linebacker in core? Can Patrick Payton step up in that leadership role? Or is it going to be Joshua Farmer? I don't know. Multiple people need to step up. On offense, you can't depend entirely on the new guys. We talked about in the previous podcast, the wide receivers, Ketron Portier, Darren Williamson, which one of these guys are going to step up, do spawn? The big physical wide receivers, can they create separations as opposed to the speedsters that were starting in Ja'Kai Douglas, Jalen Brown, and Malik Benson? We'll see where it goes from here. Vocal leadership, leadership is needed on both sides of the ball from the players. The coaching staff has shown in the past their ability to handle adversity. Let's see where it goes from here. The revenge tour cannot be over before Labor Day. How will this team step up? We'll find out next week (laughs) on 305 Insights. But again... A long one, folks, but thanks for listening. Thanks for stopping by. You know what to do. Follow, like, subscribe, do all that stuff. YouTube, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, you'll find us there. Thanks for listening to me rant about this loss. We'll see if we do a a preview. I don't necessarily like doing previews, like doing reviews, but... We're still going to put out our predictions for or reviews slash predictions for each conference. The ACC one might need some editing now, but yeah, that, that's what to expect throughout the week. And then, man, college football starts officially. I know week zero, but we're going to lead off next week with that UF UM game. It's, it's going to be a fun week, despite all the negativity I just spoke about. But anyways. Look out for all that stuff. Look out for that content coming out. And just once again, thank you for listening. And we'll catch you next time here on 305 Insights.